We are recording. Welcome everybody to the QLS seminar for February 23rd. Um, so we have the pleasure today of welcoming Dr. Sahir Bhatnagar to, as our speaker. He is um, a recent arrival at McGill University. He arrived in 2018 and is a member of Quantitative Life Sciences as well. He's assistant professor in the Department of Epidemiology, Biostatistics and Occupational Health and jointly appointed to Department of Diagnostic Radiology. And um, he's also my former PhD student. <laughs> so I'm, I'm very happy to, uh, to uh, introduce him today for sure. Um, and he's going to talk about variable selection in high dimensional genetic data. So welcome Sahir. Thank you, Celia, for, uh, for the introduction, and thanks to uh, Matsu also for, for sending the invitation. It's uh, really a pleasure to, to present to, 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 to the QLS group. I'm you know, very closely associated with, with, with the department, having uh, supervised one of the students. I'm currently supervising Jesse, uh, who's, who's also heavily involved in, in some of this work. And uh, yeah, it's, I think it's, it's, it's a great thing, the QLS program. Very happy to be here. So uh, the plan for today really is to it's kind of geared more towards the students. If there are students in the crowd, uh, try to get you interested in this problem, uh, kind of give you an introduction to, to what variable selection really is in, you know, at least my point of view of it in, in, in genetics. Okay. And, and, and I'll try to finish off by talking about future directions and some of the areas in which I think, um, at least my research, I, I, I want to go and perhaps maybe pique some of the interest of, of, some, of some of the students that are in the crowd and, and even collaborators, if, if people are interested and see some applications to their data, uh, I'd be more than happy to, uh, to chat. So, so there's, there, there are some formulas, there are some, 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 some tables, but uh, I might just gloss over them. Uh, a lot of the details are in the papers. I just, uh, this is kind of more of a high level talk, uh, kind of trying to get you interested in this problem. So uh, just to start off with, basically, in, in, in the setting that I'm interested in, uh, we're kind of concerned in the analysis of David in which we're trying to predict some sort of outcome, whether it's binary or continuous, from a number of you know, explanatory factors. Okay, and, and typically in the notation that we use in stats, Y denotes the outcome. And the X's are the predictor variables or covariates or features, you know, depending on, on what department you're in. Um, some of the methods, you know, can, can be considered black box. Okay. And so, so traditionally, you know, things like the, if, if people are familiar with Leo Bryman and his famous uh, two cultures paper, uh, he introduced the notion of, of, of black box versus uh, kind of open box where you can kind of see what's going on. And his, his very famous method, random forest, would fall under the former as a black box method. And, and he was much uh, really a proponent of black, spot, uh, black box methods. Um, so regression models are an attractive uh, framework for, this, uh, for, for approaching problems of this type. And really today we'll be focusing on you know, these classical uh, regression models to deal with high dimensional data. So I'm not focusing on Kind of the more recent literature on on deep learning uh, and, and 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 such. Okay, so so there's a, a very powerful toolbox in statistics, uh, long history over you know some sometimes over 30, 40, maybe even 50 years, um, and and so uh, several of these have been applied in the situation when n is much greater than p, and here n denotes the the, the sample size, the number of observations. Um, and, and in general, what I, when I think about these methods, I think about these tall data sets. Okay, so, you know, a, a lot of the classical methods were built a, a, around this assumption. Okay, and, and, and many of these methods in, 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 their, in, the, in their original form were not applicable to, to so-called wide data sets that perhaps we, we, we start to see much more of now. Okay, and a classic example is this uh, this data set, this I, Fisher's Iris data set, 
uh, which unfor unfortunately we still see in our classrooms today, but, but really is, 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 is no longer relevant. And, and to the instructors out there, I would, I would strongly suggest to, to, to remove this, but I, just to give you an idea of, of the types of data sets that these methods were, were traditionally uh, being applied to. Okay, and, and this is the classic linear regression model. Um, you know, very powerful analytical tool, I would say, and, and still widely used today, uh, even particularly in, in, in genetics. So the, the, the classic GWAS, this is the, the model that, that, that they use. Of course, sometimes there's, there's small adjustments here and there, but, you know, overall, this is the, the method that they use, very powerful, lots of um, fast methods to, 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 to complete this, um, this inversion here. Um, and so it, it, it's, it's, and it's also very well understood, right? But, but again, in its current form, it's not applicable to the so-called Y data. Okay, so, so one question that arises from, 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 uh, from this, you know, from if you, have, if you have collected many, many X variables, one question that arises is how do you find the important ones? Okay, and so, so classically, one of the original methods in variable selection was called best subset selection from Beale et al. in 1967. Okay, and, and basically it's, a, it's, a, it's kind of like a, an exhaustive approach where basically what you're trying to do is, is, is fit all the different possible combinations of, of all the predictors and then come up with some sort of criterion uh, to, to check which one is the best fit. Okay, and so this, is the, this would be considered the opposite of a, of a greedy approach because here you're really doing an exhaustive search. Okay, so um, you know there, there, there's there's we, we we kind of know that you know there's very few of these variables that that probably are relevant, particularly in 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 in, in large data sets. And so this best sets, uh, best, this best sub, best sorry this best subset selection has a has a has a large history, and this is basically one criterion that they use. This criterion that I'm showing here, which is basically some sort of measure of fit, and then you're kind of uh, applying some sort of penalty for the number of variables that you're actually using in the model fit. Okay, and so, so this is a, a classic um, variable selection technique that, that's often used. It, it's almost analogous, if you're familiar with the BIC, the Bayesian Information Criterion, which is also some sort of measure of fit, and then you apply some sort of penalty for the number of variables that you're actually using for that prediction. Okay, and, and, and this is kind of what, I, uh, what I've written here, right? So, so this, uh, this uh, CP criterion uses uh, the least squares loss, and then this uh, S here, the, 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 the magnitude of S, so, so that's just the number of, of non-zero, um, or the number of, of variables used in the, in the model. Okay, and so, so there's, different, uh, there's different selection criteria. So there's the CP, um, and then there's also the, the, the BIC. Okay, so a, a problem with this approach is that it's, 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 a com it's an MP hard problem. And, and Bryman has, has also formally shown that there's a lot of instability in the selection process. So depending on if you kind of do a forward selection or a backward selection, you, you're, you're likely to get very different results, okay? And, and so while this was probably a good idea on the small data sets, it's not so much a good idea anymore on, on, on the data sets that we see today. So in, a, in about 1970, in a sem seminal paper in published in Technometrics, uh, these authors proposed what they call, what we call ridge regression, okay? And so basically the, the idea is that uh, they, they proposed adding this, um, this penalty, which was kind of uh, a constraint on the amount you can spend on your, on your beta, okay? And this, this penalty is what, what we call this, um, this L2 norm squared, which is basically just the sum of the individual betas uh, squared, okay? And, and so it might not seem intuitive uh, right away why this could work as a solution. Um, 
but but if you, if you just take a look at, at 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 the problem in in its in its least squares form so so if you look at this uh, uh this least squares problem here um the problem when you have n much much smaller than p is that this matrix uh this matrix here this x transpose x is no longer invertible and so the idea from from Horrell and Kennard was to add this extra piece, this lambda i. So you, as soon as you add a certain amount to this uh, matrix, it, it kind of makes it invertible. And 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 the appeal of this method was also that it's an there's it's an exact method, in the sense that you can get an exact solution. So if you have uh, a least square solver, you could also um, use that least square solver to to solve this uh, ridge regression problem. Of course, there's this um, you know small detail here about the the lambda, the tuning parameter, and how that's selected. Um, but but you know I'll kind of leave that as, as as kind of just a detail that um, that there's there's methods to to figure that out. But what's what's really nice again about this procedure is that uh, you can um, use this method for high dimensional data. Okay, and then, and by high dimensional I mean again the wide data sets. Um, yeah, and so so this is just a, a formula to show you that you know if you know in the in in a very trivial case if we let the x transpose x equal the identity matrix, um, we get this nice kind of relationship between uh, the ridge and the uh, MCO. Sorry, that's again in French, but that that's the least squares estimate. Okay, so basically what it means is that we're taking the least squares estimate and shrinking it by some uh factor of lambda okay and and, and so this is kind of a, a visual uh, so so this gray line here that we're seeing is the least squares estimate and then the 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 red line is the the ridge estimate okay so we can see that you know for high va higher values here for the least squares you get shrunk by some sort of value uh and that value is the one one plus lambda factor Yeah, I think most people are familiar with with um, with with these wide data sets that we see today. And and again, this is kind of what I mean by by wide, uh, where we have you know much much fewer samples than the number uh, of variables. And and this we see in in particularly in genetics, uh, which is the focus of this talk. Um, but again, in, in neuroimaging and and I'm sure in, in radiology as well, we see we see a lot of uh, these high dimensional data sets. Okay, and so so this is a I, I find a, a nice example, a nice uh, diagram, which kind of illustrates why we can't fit OLS to high dimensional data. Okay, so there's a lot going on in this figure, but I think it's it's important to have a very clean example to explain this um, phenomenon. Sorry, I, I missed the reference here, but if if you're interested, I can pass on the reference as well. So so this is a very simple uh, training data where we have only two observations. Okay, and we have uh, these covariates here. So we have um, age and sex, and we're trying to use age and sex to predict weight. Okay, and so what we're showing here are two possible solutions. Okay, so so if if you know if the intercept is forty, beta one is one, beta two is zero, we get a, basically a a perfect fit, and and we can also do the same thing. Uh, using this combination. So basically, you know, the, the fundamental problem is that there's many, many solutions um, to, to fitting the, the training data. Okay, and so that's what you can see in this, um, this solid line is one of those solutions. Right, so we have these two data points, which is our training data. And we're, we're, we're fitting uh, exactly the train data using one of those solutions. Okay, alternatively, we could also have a perfect fit used as represented by these two dotted lines here. So these two dotted lines represent another um, exact solution. Okay, and, and, and again, the problem is that we don't know which one to pick. And, and moreover, uh, we're, we're clearly overfitting to the, to the, to the training data, right? So, so, so we do a, a perfect job at, at fitting to the training, but, but a terrible job at, at fitting to the test data. Okay, so, so that's the fundamental problem is that there's actually, it's not that there's no solutions, 
which which I think sometimes gets said in the literature uh, mistakenly, it's 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 the fact that there's actually too many solutions and we don't know which one to pick. So 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 that's the problem of why we can't fit um, OLS to, to to high dimensional data in a very very you know simple setting here. But but this generalizes, of course, to, to much more uh, many more covariates. So um, this is a, a famous picture from the uh, Elements of Statistical Learning by, by Hasty et al. And so basically, this, is, uh, this kind of explains the, the difference or the trade-off between uh, model complexity and, and prediction error. OK, so, so on this um, x-axis, what we have here is model complexity. And so what we mean here by model complexity is not so much you know, a random forest versus uh, least squares versus gradient boosting it's more basically the amount of information that you're using the amount of variables that's going into the model and so you know the more and more variables that you use uh, the lower the prediction error will be on your training sample right so so you can keep training until you get basically almost no loss however if you're in this regime here um, your your prediction error on your testing sample will will, will be poor Okay, so so that's kind of what we mean by low bias. So so low bias means that um, we're going to do a good job at at getting to the truth in terms of like the the estimated coefficients, but we're going to do a bad job in terms of that prediction um, variance. Okay, and and then on the opposite end of the spectrum is you know we can have the low model complexity, um, so a much simpler model, a sparse model, but we're going to do a a pretty you know. And, and, and we'll do a pretty good job on the prediction error side uh, in, in the test sample. So that's what we call high bias, meaning that we're willing to sacrifice that we'll get some things wrong at the, at, at the benefit of actually doing pretty good on the, on the test set. Okay, and, and then there's always you know, things in the middle here where, where it's kind of a trade-off between the two. But, the, but this is basically the, the, the two regimes, I think a lot of us, um, think about when we're when we're dealing with real data analysis okay so so depending on which crowd you're in which department you're in you know you might be you might you know one and there's no right answer i would say i think it, it really depends on on the context that you're that you're interested in um and 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 also the the type of data that you have okay so what what i'm interested in and, and and particularly because of the the you know the the data sets that i've encountered is is the sparsity principle okay and so so this is a an image i like to show where we have this uh, response variable y and a whole bunch of um predictor variables x okay and and so the 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 question becomes you know which one of these predictor variables is associated with my response uh, y Okay, and, and, and the bet on sparsity principle is basically saying, um, you know, only, I'm only, I'm going to assume that very few of these predictor variables is associated with the response. Okay, and again, this is, this is an assumption. We don't, we don't know the truth, of course, but this is what the bet on sparsity principle is. And, and a lot of what, and the motivation for a lot of the vari so-called variable selection uh, methods in, in, in high dimensional data. Okay, and, and there's, a, there's, there's a reason for this, and, and it goes back again to, to, to Hasty, who says that, you know, you should use a procedure that does well in sparse problems, since no procedure does well in, in dense problems. Okay? And, and, and maybe people have, you know, take objection to this, to this quote now, 20 years later, uh, but, but I think it's still quite relevant, you know, de depending on, on the types of data that you, that you do work with. Okay, and, and there's, again, there's, there's a reason for this is that often we don't have enough data to estimate all these parameters. And even if we do, you know, it might not, if we're interested in, in kind of causality or, or, or understanding uh, mechanisms for disease, it, it, it might not be so interesting if you actually end up estimating all these different parameters and, and, and all of them are non-zero, let's say. Right, so, the, so there's no selection happening. You're just ending up with a very complex model, which becomes very difficult to explain 
you know, the mechanisms uh, underlying the, 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 the prediction of the response. Uh, so, so that's more of the kind of, I would say the subject matter part that, that the other part is obviously the computation, right? So if, if you're assuming these sparse models, there's, there's a lot of progress that has been made on the computational aspect, making these, you know, these variable selection methods very competitive um, because of this sparsity assumption. So if you don't make this sparsity assumption, then a lot of the tricks that, that are being used currently in, these, in, in the software programs uh, it can can no longer be applied, and and so some of the tricks I'm referring to are things like like um, like feature screening, right? So, so there's a lot of work that's been that's been done on feature screening, um, a lot of work that's been done on uh, so-called the active set strategy, where you know you, you're kind of again it, it, that active set strategy assumes this this sparsity, okay? And, and so that's why the computation becomes very very fast. Okay, so, so this is a thought experiment. This is, again, uh, something I like to show. Um, and I think it's, you know, particularly re relevant today, just to kind of justify to you that, you know, the sparsity idea is not just in, 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 in statistics or not just in, 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 in academia, right? It's, it's, I think, you know, if you think about how you would schedule a meeting for, for, for 20 people, uh, you know, if we're, if we're in person, I'd probably ask everybody to to, to give their opinion, but I, you know, I think the first thing that comes to most people's minds is, is, is schedule a, a, a doodle poll, right? And so, you know, the, you end up with this doodle poll, and I, and again, I, I want to thank, I want to give credit to Celia for this. This is an example she gave uh, way back when I was when I was defending my thesis. And so, basically, you know, she kept telling me how she was so frustrated with these doodle polls because you know she would answer them, and you know, she'd be the first to answer them. And she'd have to block off all these times in her in her schedule. And then by the time everybody answered, you know, like, you know, all those times would get filled up. And so she'd have to kind of restart. And it's just, you know, it's, it's maddening if, if, if you have to block all these times in your agenda. And so, you know, what 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 might be a better thing to do is propose two times and just accept the fact that, you know, not everybody's going to be attending this meeting. Right. So so there's a there's a sparsity assumption going on there. Is that I'm going to make it much simpler for everybody by just proposing two times instead of these, you know, hundred times that are shown here, and then just you know accept the fact that you know not everybody's going to make it, and that's kind of the same thing when we're doing variable selection in in, in real data analysis is that we're kind of accepting the fact that you know we might not get all the true associations, we might not you know estimate the proper uh, regression coefficients. Um, but nevertheless, we'll, you know, the ones that we do estimate, we'll do a good job of those, All right? And, and we'll give you something that's, you know, that's, that's reasonably interpretable. So, so yeah, that's, that's kind of basically my, my um, introduction to, to, to high dimensional data and kind of where it's come up to now. And then uh, the next part of the talk, I'm gonna kind of go over one of the applications that, that, uh, that I've worked on. Uh, and so this is in uh, from the UK Biobank. And sorry, as I mentioned before, I, I apologize for some of the slides that are being in French. Uh, it was it was just from a previous talk. I, I, I failed to, to to translate. But but I'll, I'll if you if there are any questions, just please let me know. Um. So so I'm I'm sure this crowd is very familiar with the UK Biobank, um, a very rich uh, data source. And uh, sorry, there's a there's a question in the chat. Yeah, do you want to answer them now, Sahir? Please, you know, if you want to answer them now, I mean, go right ahead, or we can leave them for the end as well. Yeah, no, I can. Um, yeah, this one's this one's a tough one. Uh, <laughs> yeah, this is a more philosophical one. It it might be. Um, yeah, I mean, like I said, you can leave it for the end. We can have a bit of a general discussion on this one at the end, because it it's going to depend on the data. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so I, I, I was think... uh, asking the question for, you know, I know that it's a it's a challenging uh, one, but it's uh, also uh, of interest, right? Often we want to know whether we can actually uh, predict, say, a PRS with a sparse model. So there are examples like you show, but there are also a counter example like a human height where people actually use all the SNP explain a reasonable amount of heritability. Whereas, you know, if you use only GWAS uh, SNPs, you can only explain very small fraction of heritability, right? So that is a, you know, an example that 
demonstrate uh, using all the SNPs actually benefit for uh, explaining heritability. But in terms of whether you can improve uh, PRS prediction, I think that is uh, maybe a separate question. Yeah, no, definitely. I think that's that's always a, a constant debate I have. And, and there's actually a, an application that I'll show later, um, which, which we'll touch on that. But, but I agree. I think I think you know part of this, and I think it falls nice on this slide, is that the UK Biobank has has allowed a lot of these discussions to take place, whereas previously, you know, we we kind of didn't we didn't even think twice. Um, so 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 the example you gave about human height, I think I think I think the example came from from UK Biobank, where where that's where they were starting uh, to be able to show this very you know that height is very polygenic trait. And, 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 you know, have the power to, to estimate those coefficients or estimate a, a, a multivariable PRS um, because otherwise it, it, was, it was much, much more difficult to do. Um, but, but yeah. I, There's a follow-up comment from Jean-Baptiste Paulin saying across validation may be part of the answer. Uh, also a little bit tangential perhaps to where you want to go. So, but. Uh, yeah. yeah. We can leave it to the end maybe. So I guess. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the, the question. Uh, but yeah, I'll, I'll uh, maybe I'll keep it open, or you can. Yeah. Yeah. So 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 again, um, I think most people are familiar with this with this uh, UK Biobank, but basically again, a very uh, rich data set. You know, high dimensional, half a million individuals. Uh, you know, it's, it's more than just uh, genotyping data now. They have whole genome sequencing. I think they have some imaging data as well. Um, again, very uh, a, rich, a rich source. You know? and, and for maybe biostatisticians like me, um, kind of, I need, to, I need to work with someone in, in the genetics field to fully grasp, you know, the, 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 the potentials of, of this data set. Um, so, so that's something also that, that I'm always interested in, in, in collaborating with people who, who have the subject matter expertise, and then we can try to help with the, the methods and the computation. Um, so, so this is what uh, a data set might look like. Again, you know, I wrote Gene here because I, used, I gave this talk to, to non kind of um, biology crowd. And so, 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 but these represent SNFs, but all this to say is that it is a very clean version of, of the data set. You know, I understand that um, you know, there's, there's, there's imputed SNPs and, and, and this is kind of, you can assume that this is like hard, this has been hard called no missing data, which is, you know, clearly not um, always the case. Um, but, but, but this is just a, a, sim a very simplified um, uh, idea of what, what the data set might, might actually look like. Um, yeah, maybe I'll skip that. So, so one thing that 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 comes up a lot in in in, in fitting these uh, these models, whether it's a GWAS model or a, a kind of a polygenic model where you're fitting many SNPs at the same time, is this uh, confounding by by population structure? Okay, and 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 so this is a I think a nice diagram that kind of illustrates the 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 problem is that if you were to if you have kind of two subpopulations, um, so subpopulation uh, A and B. So you can see that if you were to compare kind of the proportion of, of genotypes in cases versus controls within a given population, you won't see any sort of um, difference. So, so that's, that, that's what this is. So this comparison on its own, you see no difference. And then same thing here, this comparison on your, your own, you don't see any difference. Um, but as soon as you kind of merge the cohorts together, um, you see a difference. And, and, and that difference is not actually um, due to uh, case control status, or it's not due to the to any sort of association between um, genotype and 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 case and control status. It's actually just due to the the population, right? So the population that you belong to. And so this is the the classic um, you know population structure uh, confounding. And so there you know there's you know the, you can say you can argue that you know let's let's just include population. So like in, in this, the traditional way to account for confounding in a regression setting is just do something like where you have, you know, population um, plus SNP, right? Plus an error term. <coughs> uh, but of course, you know, this, this population is, is not given, right? We, we, we often don't know um, which population an individual came from. And, and moreover, you know, the 
you know, we, we, we're all kind of uh, mixed, right? So, so we can be part of you know, many populations. And, and so uh, that also becomes a problem. So it's, it's, not, it's not as simple as just some sort of a confounding adjustment uh, in, in a regression model. Um, yeah, I think I'll, I'll skip that. So, so again, there, there's, there's kind of uh, the, the problem here that the observations are not independent. Um, so, so that's, uh, but, but uh, luckily, or <clears throat> fortunately from, from genetic data, we can estimate this kind of dependence between uh, the observations. And, and the way we do that is using this uh, so-called kinship matrix, right? So, so this kinship matrix is some sort of um, kind of, you know, average of a, a, you can almost see it as some sort of correlation between individuals, some sort of co covariance matrix, uh, where, where each uh, cell in that matrix represents uh, basically how correlated one individual is with another. Right, and, and so if you have this um, kinship, kinship matrix, you can kind of account for this uh, population structure using this um, kinship matrix. Okay, and, and sorry, I, I didn't specify here, but, but what I mean here by X kinship is that, you know, there, there, there's basically, um, I mean, there's a lot of work that's, that's gone on in, in figuring out uh, what set of SNPs you can use to calculate the kinship matrix. So what I mean here, X kinship, is that it's a, it's a select set of genotypes that are used uh, in the calculation of the kinship matrix, which I denote here by, by phi. Okay, and so, so again, I, I don't go into too much detail. I kind of, in, in the method that I'm going to propose, I kind of assume that <coughs> we're given uh, this phi matrix, but, but of course, a lot of work has gone on into, into figuring out how to even calculate this, this phi matrix. Uh, but again, for the purpose of this talk, I kind of assume that this is, this is uh, known. Okay, and, and so um, what we might uh, do to, to figure out kind of some sort of association or do some sort of association test is run a, a, a linear mixed model, right? So a linear mixed model, uh, what we have here is is this is the, the polygenic term, right? So, so, so the, some sort of weighted average of, of, of each of the SNPs. Uh, and then we have uh, the, the polygenic uh, random effect. And then we have this uh, error term, right? So this is a, a classic mixed model. Uh, there's nothing specific to genetics here. Uh, the only thing that comes into play is more the, the high, dimensional, uh, high dimensional aspect uh, of the data set. Okay, and, and so again, the, the goal here is to estimate these betas, right? So that's it's to, get, to, uh, to get basically unconfounded estimates of those betas. So in other words, if I don't account for this polygenic term, uh, which is given by uh, a normal, which follows a normal distribution with mean zero, and this is the variance. Um, if you don't account for that, then, then you'll have some sort of biased estimation uh, in, in, in your betas. Right, so, so there's a few terms here. There's a few parameters that I, I just want to explain. I mean, again, I don't expect everybody to fully follow the math here. I'm just trying to give uh, kind of some intuition behind uh, the method. But up to now, this is, uh, again, a classic model. So whether you're doing a regular GWAS, I, I think if you're just even doing a, a univariate GWAS, um, this is the model or this is the standard model that, that they use now, right? So mm -hmm. it's no longer just a linear regression. Uh, they will, of course, account for um, that, that this, this polygenic term. Okay, so, so the sigma squared here is the total phenotypic variance. Um, eta is what we call the, the heritability of the phenotype. So basically how much of the phenotype um, is explained by, by the genetics. And, and then uh, conditional on these random effects, uh, Y follows a, a normal distribution, right? So, so what's nice about this uh, model is that again, conditional on these random effects, we get a, a normal distribution for which uh, there's a lot of developed theory for, for association tests and, 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 and um, even, even kind of uh, diagnostics. Were there any questions uh, on, on this model or is, is this okay? Uh, shouldn't the mean for Y be uh like X beta or, or 
are you assuming it's standardized somehow? Yeah, sorry, I didn't. Yeah, sorry, I didn't, I didn't mention the the standardized part. But yeah, that's a that's a good point. Exactly. All right. Thanks. <clears throat> Um, right, so so uh, as I mentioned before, you know, one solution would be to try to apply the ridge um, or the so-called lasso. So the lasso uh, performs these uh, variable selection, so it actually specifically sets um, variables to to zero. Um, you know, so so the ridge, as I mentioned, uses this L two norm squared penalty. The lasso uses L one penalty, which is the absolute value of the individual regression coefficients. The main difference between the ridge and the lasso, the lasso does. Um, shrinkage, but it also does selection. Ridge doesn't do any, uh, any, any selection. Um, but again, the, the issue is that you can't just apply uh, these methods directly to a linear mixed model. Okay, and, and again, I'm, I'm talking about um, these multivariable models where we're fitting many SNPs at the same time. Okay, I'm, I'm not in the kind of GWAS univariate regime here. And, 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 and again, maybe that's a, a discussion for another time, but I think a lot of people have already looked at um, kind of the benefits between um, the univariate versus the uh, multivariable models, and, and they can be used for, for kind of different settings. Uh, GWAS, again, has, has, you can't really beat GWAS in terms of computation. Um, it's, it's why it's uh, so popular and, 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 and rightfully so, it, you know, it's, it's, it's led to many discoveries. Um, but, but now with, with these larger sample sizes, uh, we can try to kind of push more towards these uh, multivariable fits and multivariable models. Um, so, so what, you know, uh, the motivation for our method is it, it was based on this uh, uh, observation of what people were doing if they wanted to try to fit these, um, you know, kind of linear mixed models using the lasso penalty or the ridge penalty. So what they would first do is, is basically, um, fit a, a, a null model uh, where you uh, only have this one random effect, right? So, so you, you, and, then, and then subsequently you use the residuals from the first step because what you've effectively done is remove that, that kind of dependence between the observations and then use that in a traditional lasso model which assumes the independent observations. Right, so, so this is kind of a visual, uh, a visual of, of what's actually happening. So again, we have uh, the rows here are individuals, the columns are the, the SNPs. Um, what we would have to do is come up with this, 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 this kinship matrix. And so again, X kinship here just represents the SNPs that I'm using to calculate the kinship matrix. Okay, and so what I get is this kind of N by N symmetric matrix, okay, where, where each, um, kind of uh, each entry represents the uh, correlation between individuals on some level. Okay, so and then uh, uh, what I'll do is I'll I'll fit a, a a a null model where there's no there are no covariates, there's no predictors, there's no SNPs, just this ra uh, single random effect. Okay, and then again I take the residuals from step one and then fit this uh, regular traditional um, uh, model, right? So, so it's a, now I can fit a, a multivariable model using uh, any sort of, you know, lasso regression routine. Okay, so, so this was what was, uh, this was kind of state of the art uh, when, when I first uh, got into looking at, at, at these types of methods. Um, the, the, there, there, there's basically one, or, or separate, there's a few issues here that, that, that we found. Um, and, and they became kind of more relevant as we got more and more uh, into these kind of polygenic risk scores and polygenic models um, where we're fitting many SNPs at the same time. And it was basically the observation that, you know, this, um, so this matrix, right? So, so this uh, kinship matrix that I'm using the problem is that if let's say gene two is causal, right? So it's, it's, it's associated with my response because it's being adjusted for in the second stage. What happens is that the effect of gene two on my response gets completely removed, right? And, and, and so you can argue that, you know, a lot of the, liter um, 
a lot of the univariate mixed models, what they do is they tell you to use um, a so-called leave one out pr uh, chromosome procedure, where basically the, the, the SNP that you're testing, let's say it's on chromosome one, well, when I'm constructing my kinship matrix, I completely remove all the SNPs from chromosome one as to not have this kind of cross-contamination. So that can work, and that's a decent strategy in the univariate setting. But in the multivariable setting, you kind of don't know, right? Like you, you don't know which one is causal. And so you can't really avoid uh, this, what they call proximal contamination. Um, and, and, and also this, this paper uh, by Karim Wakausha, who's, who's a collaborator of, of, of ours, um, also showed that you know, some of these methods can, show, uh, can, can suffer from, from lots of power uh, reduction. Okay, so, so our proposal basically you know, focuses a lot on the, on the computation aspect of it. It's, it's not so much um, a, a new method um, so much as it's more uh, the, the computational aspects where we're providing uh, a tool um, with uh, specifically made for uh, this setting. So we're, so we're talking really, you know, some of the inputs of our software accepts a kinship matrix and, and, and it will output um, these, these um, predicted values for, for uh, the betas. It will fit these coefficients. Um, and the key point here is that we're doing this all in, in one step. Okay, and, and so it's, it's a basically a linear mixed model with a lasso penalty as applied to um, this specific setting in, in, in genetics, right? So, so the, L, the, the LMM with an L1 penalty has been developed previously, uh, but it was never applicable to, to genetic data, right? There's still some, uh, as Celia always likes to say, the devil's in the details. There's a lot of details that, that we had to work out uh, from the computational aspect to, to try to fit these models. And so, so there's a there's software available. Um, there's 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 help pages, and and I encourage you to try to use this software. Uh, admittedly, you know this is just kind of step one in 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 the in the pipeline. Um, there's there's still a lot of limitations to this software. Um, the main one being the computational time, um, and I'll I'll try to touch on that briefly uh, and explain some of some of the issues there. Um, but but I think it's a it's a good first step. Um, definitely not a, a final product, but but you know something that's um, that was worth getting out there, I think, and 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 something that I'm continuously working on to to try to improve, try to improve the computation, um, add uh, different kind of penalties. So 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 this one was specific for the lasso penalty, uh, but there's an, uh, other uh, penalties that have been shown to have better uh, variable selection properties. So that's another uh, direction that that we're trying to that we're trying to take. Uh, but, but again, uh, a lot of the details are in the paper, so I'll probably skim over uh, a lot of the math here and, and just get kind of to the discussion, uh, given that there's only about 10 or 12 minutes left. Um, but, but if you're interested, you know, please feel free. Um, if, if you're interested in trying to apply this, if you think that this method could be applied to your data, or if you're interested in the methods aspect, please uh, feel free to, to, to get in touch. Okay, so, so again, this is just a, a high level overview of, of our approach. Uh, again, we're, we're basically fitting the model in, in one step, right? So, so we have the, the, the X matrix, so that's our, um, that, that's the SNPs that we're kind of testing. And then we have this, this polygenic term, right? So, so the polygenic term, again, is, is of high dimension in the sense that, especially if you're trying to fit this on the UK Biobank, this is like an N by N matrix, right? So this is a very, um, large matrix and that's one of the problems actually in, in, in the computation right so it's the fact that we need to somehow store this n by n matrix of some sort right and, and of course there's some tricks we can use um, but nevertheless you know if you're trying to fit this on the complete uk biobank it it, it, it won't work right in, in its current form and that's again um where i think a lot of the 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 research at least in, in my research, I, I'm heading towards, and it's something that, that I mentioned in my abstract of, of why I think the Cisco methods have kind of lagged behind is because, you know, and, and, and it's not a criticism to statisticians. It's just, I think we need more people trying to bridge that gap, right? Because right now, you know, statisticians kind of work in, in simulated data, you know, maybe old data sets that, that, you know, aren't so much relevant today. 
Um, and, and it's tough, right? So, so from a statistician point of view, they have to kind of develop the theory, do the simulations, uh, apply it to real data and, and, and you know, write the paper and that, that all that's, all those steps can take a long time, let alone focus on the software and focus on the implementation, right? So, so there's, I, I, I can see why there's this gap, but I think we need more, more people working on, on, on kind of the bridging the two. And, and really, because there's a lot of been, a lot of developments that have been done on the statistical side, I think a lot less on the, on the computational side, at least transferring, you know, a lot of the advancements in the models uh, over to, to, to the genetics world. Um, yeah, so I, I'm going to, I'm going to skip, no, maybe, maybe I'll go over this. Uh, yeah, maybe I'll go over this a little bit quickly. Um, so um, this is, uh, so, you know, there's a lot of, uh, sorry, equations here, but basically this is the part uh, that I wanted to, again, highlight. Um, and so there, this is the model, right? So, so the, what I'm highlighting here, this is the model here. Uh, and it's no different from, from what I just showed previously. Uh, the other piece is, is this here, is that now conditional on uh, your, your, you know, your, 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 your betas, your random effects, you have this multivariate normal model. And, and what ended up happening is that your objective function uh, looks something like this. Okay, so this is my objective function. And, and, and so right away, what you see, if, if you're familiar with, with optimization is you see, anytime you see an inverse, like you, I get scared, right? So, so usually inverses are, are difficult. And, and if you look at the literature, you'll see that oftentimes if you have to take an inverse, usually there's another way around it, or usually you do something else. So we avoid inverses at all costs. And that's basically kind of what we, what we did here as well. So taking an inverse of a, of a, of a N by N matrix, especially as large as, you know, let's say UK, but not even UK biobank, but even like a, a 10,000 by 10,000, you know, you get into um, numerical issues. So just in, in terms of the algorithms that are used to calculate the inverse uh, can be uh, very unstable. So, so in general, it's a bad idea to take inverses of large matrices. And often what you try to do is come up with these uh, certain tricks. So, so whether it's some sort of uh, factorization, um, which is kind of what we did here. Uh, there's, there's also something called chronicle factorization. So basically what you're trying to do is, is come up with a sparse version of this matrix. And so if a lot of the entries in that matrix are zero, that makes it a lot easier to take the inverse. Right, so, so these are all tricks, computational tricks that are being uh, currently used uh, in, 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 in the literature. And, and so that's basically what, what we did. That's, that's kind of, uh, I won't, I won't uh, go much more uh, into that, but, but again, the details are, are available in, in, in the paper. And, and, and I just wanted to highlight the fact that um, uh, this is kind of what, what, what's being done. And so, yeah, you, um, you mentioned, is this the same technique? Uh, in fast LMM, yes, that's that's exactly right. So so they um, they use this kind of um, diagonalization trick. So basically, what what happens is that if you can assume uh, this spectral decomposition, uh, what you can end up doing is creating some sort of diagonal matrix, right? And that's kind of what I show uh, in 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 this in this slide is that. Uh, once I factorize my, my kinship matrix into that spectral decomposition, what I can do is pre-multiply my left singular vector. So that's what I'm showing here. So I pre-multiply my left singular vector by the response, and I get this Y tilde. And I do, this, I do the same thing with my X matrix, right? So, so I get these, um, basically what I'm doing is I'm rotating my Y variable and rotating my X matrix. And so, as, so by doing this rotation, I've effectively made the individuals independent. And now what I end up with is, is this very nice um, W inverse. And this W inverse is very easy to take because W is now a diagonal matrix. And, and that's, that's the trick that's used as well in-, in, in But the uh, SVD step is still take n cubic, right? So that is to be able to get to that uh, single uh, spectral decomposition, you still need to deal with a large sample size or a large SNP. Definitely, yeah, definitely. That's uh, that's that's always a problem. But I, I mean, I I haven't tested this, you know, on on UK Biobank, but um, 
I know that uh, there has been, there's, I think Flash, I think Flash PCA has, has done some progress in, in that direction um, because effectively that's what, that's what they're, they're doing is calculating some sort of um, principal component on this. Mm -hmm. And so I think Flash PCA has, uh, has been used and, and shown to, to work well. So, so definitely there's probably some more um, tricks just involved in this. And def you're, you're right in saying that this is definitely a big assumption. Um, but I think uh, there, there, there has been work done in, in that see. direction. I thought you, you are testing this on UK Bell that data. It, it's not? Or uh, it's a subset, a subset of the data. Yeah. A subset? Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, so again, um, I'll, I'll skip over this, uh, uh, this part, but there's, yeah, there's kind of a lot going on there. Uh, just quickly to the, um, to the results. Um, yeah, so the real data applications. Yeah. So, so, so basically what we did was, um, in the real data. So specifically I'll, I'll talk about UK biobank, but basically what we took was, was 10,000 uh, LD prune SNPs to predict standing height in about 18,000 related individuals. And so the related individuals here, we used um, the King software to estimate kind of relatedness. So they, they give some sort of degree of relatedness. And so that's why we picked the 18,000 most related. Um, and, and as uh, was mentioned previously by you, the, the standing height is, is very polygenic, right? We also used, uh, used two other data sets each one with a different feature. So again, UK Biobank was, was kind of, you know, highly polygenic. Um, the GOT20 simulated data set, um, there wasn't, uh, basically they're very related individuals. So 679 related individuals um, and there's very sparse signals. So it's basically the opposite of the UK Biobank. And then there's mouse crosses, which is basically uh, kind of a hybrid of both. So, so there's uh, lots of cor correlated markers and, and lots of kind of correlated, um, you know, strains of, of, of the mice. So this was kind of the, uh, the results in, in UK Biobank. So what I've, I have kind of two graphs here. Um, and, and what I did is I compared it to the two-step method. So the two-step method was uh, what I just mentioned. And then the traditional lasso with a principal component adjustment. So, the, so that's another technique that I didn't talk about, but that you can use is, is fit a lasso model and use the principal components of the kinship matrix as uh, unpenalized predictors in the lasso model. So that can work as well. And basically what we've shown uh, in the left panel here is that you know, basically for, for most values of the lambda, you know, our, our method performs better in, the, um, in, a, in a held out, um, Sorry, this is sorry. This is the model selection set. So, in a model selection set, uh, our our method performs better than the uh, than the two step and the lasso. Um, then we also compared in terms of the uh, mean squared error in a test set. So, this is an independent held out test set where we've already already chosen the optimal lambda parameter, and and again we show that uh, we achieve. We're in in the corner here where we achieve basically the lowest prediction error while uh, keeping the sparsest model, right? So, so we have this, um, this Bayesian uh, linear mixed model, which is the reason why we had to show this on the log scale, because it picked very, like, you know, many, many variable, uh, variables, which is, which is fine because, you know, that's the method wasn't meant for selection. Um, whereas, you know, we have the, the two-step and the lasso both show that, again, you know, higher, a little bit higher prediction error and, and more, uh, more variables being selected. Um, yeah, so I just want to finish off with with this uh, this application. So this is not again. This was uh, published before um, the GG Mix paper. So at the time we didn't have uh, we hadn't developed this, uh, but this this was just a, an application of the of the lasso model with a principal component adjustment uh, to, um, to predicting a kind of a, a, a bone mineral density, right? So, so this is just kind of showing uh, the, uh, the applicability of polygenic risk scores. Particularly why I wanted to bring this study up is because 
it's an example of how polygenic risk scores are being used um, you know in, in in the not I mean it's not it hasn't been applied in the clinic yet but I, eventually that's the goal and that's you know the the collaboration with with Brent Richards and Celia so Brent is a big proponent of, of, of PRSs and he's been uh, and we worked with him on on this paper uh, to, to try to even fit the lasso model on on UK biobank size so so this wasn't a mixed model it was a, a lasso model with PCs but even at the time which is a few years ago you know this was uh, this took quite a bit of time we had to you know rent amazon servers to to run this on and 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 it, it wasn't trivial right for for, for biobank data size um but for, in particular a question for fitting the lasso model don't you actually just need a summary statistics to fit the regular lasso without using the individual level genotype and phenotype data because um so so have a scalability problem uh is, is there an equivalence there? I, I thought um, you would need also like some sort of like measure of correlation between the SNPs as well. And you well, wouldn't be able to fit in. There is a sort of thousand genome like a linkage to equilibrium reference data you could use as a surrogate for, for the in-sample LD. But maybe okay. you're right, maybe in-sample LD can provide you a better estimates for the effect size. Right. So there are, you know, there are discussion about sort of mismatch of LD uh, between different data sets. Right. But then if, uh, you know, if a scalability is a problem, then I think using the thousand genome LD uh, plus the summary statistics uh, usually will work uh, you know, quite fast because you don't need to actually deal with, uh, you know, a half million people. Right, right, right. That's a good point. I, I, I haven't seen that. Um, definitely, I think, I mean, it's, 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 it's a good thing to do when you don't have the individual level data. Um, and, and we didn't do it here, but also like you, you know, you don't um, you you don't have the ability in summary stats to, to model any sort of interactions, right? So, um, that's if, it, yeah, that's if, if, if that's a potential for explaining more of the heritability, maybe. Um, but definitely, I agree. You know, if, if summary if the summary stats methods are definitely important. Uh, um, but it, but in this, we you know we had we we did have access to the individual of data, and and this is the, the 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 figure I wanted to show is basically the reason why. Um, I thought this was an interesting work is basically what we developed was this polygenic risk score, what we call GSOS here. And so we're basically showing that, you know, it can be used as a negative prediction tool. In other words, that, you know, it's very expensive to get this, um, you know, this DEXA scan, what they call it, to, to measure or, or to assess kind of your bone mineral density. Um, and, and so if you use this kind of GSOS as a tool to, to, to say, look, these people have very low risk of ever developing any sort of, you know, complicated outcomes related to BMD. Um, you, there's no point in screening them, like focus your money on these high risk individuals. And so basically what we did show is that, you know, the sensitivity and specificity were basically the same if you screened for those individuals, right? So, so it, it's, it's, I think there's a lot of power here uh, as a negative screening uh, a negative screening tool. Um, sorry, I'm going to skip over all this and just go to my. Um, yeah, I'm just going to go to my acknowledgments uh, because again, a lot of this. So I haven't presented any of the new work yet with 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 some of my students, but but we have Kai here who's been working a lot on on extending this model to the uh, non-convex settings. So so non-convex penalties like SCAD and MCP, which I've shown to have better variable selection properties. Jesse has been working on kind of the uh, survival outcome aspect of this in, in, in again, the, the high dimensional setting. And, and they've, been, um, uh, they've been, you know, instrumental in kind of moving this work uh, forward. I also have uh, Julian, who's, who's a student in biostatistics at McGill. And he's been working on uh, working with, with, with a data set that actually involves combining data from multiple cohorts. So of individual level data from multiple cohorts. And this again, uh, brings the question of, of adding random effects for, for, um, for the different cohorts, uh, potentially. Um, yeah, so I, I just wanna thank everybody and thank you for your attention. So thank you, Sahir. I don't know if uh, Celia is still here, if she had to, if she had to leave, but- uh, Celia, had to, Celia had to step out. 
Okay, um, so I'm going to step in then. Uh, Sahir, uh, thank you very, very much for a fantastic talk. Uh, I think it was really nicely uh, uh, targeted for uh, the QLS student and, and the, the, the most of the, of, the, uh, of the regular crowd for, for this uh, seminar. So I'd like to see if there are any remaining questions. And if so, you can put them in the chat or you can raise your hand and I will call upon you. Maybe I can ask one more question. So uh, for the, uh, so you compare with the Bayesian uh, sparse LMM. So as it's quite surprising actually BS LMM actually perform a lot worse than the uh, GG mix uh, because uh, it seems that there are a, there is a Bayesian equivalent to express sparsity in uh, similar to the Lasso model that you have, because I know that you use a mix, linear mix model where the beta is a fixed effect, right? It's a point estimate. Yes. But yes. in the BSLMM, the, the beta is actually follow a mixture distribution. So that is, you can have a mixture of Gaussian, say one has a large variance, one has small variance, where you can have this uh, spike and slap type of prior, where one is this slab, which is Gaussian, the other one is a uh, spike, which only center at zero for a non-zero density. So, uh, you know, have you thought about uh, sort of imposing a prior Bayesian prior on beta as well, besides the uh, confounder random effects with the uh, Bayesian, with the Gaussian distributions? Yeah, um, so I've looked at, uh, I haven't looked at the spike and slab. I've been looking more at the, um, the, the so-called Laplace and horseshoe and finished horseshoe priors. Um, uh, but in, in our experiments, like, I mean, it hasn't, it hasn't, we haven't been applying that to genetic data yet, but so far in our experiments, we found that, um, especially like the horseshoe and Finnish horseshoe, they require this, uh, one of the parameters is basically like the effective number of non-zeros. Um, and so it, it seems like it's very sensitive to, uh, those choices that you need to make. Mm -hmm. And so I would say that, um, I think we're, we're still, I mean, I haven't looked, uh, at, detailed into this BSLMM, um, but from, from, from our experience, the BSLMM was actually quite fast. Um, so I'm, I'm, but, but I don't know why, like in, in our experience with the horseshoe and finished horseshoe, it's actually quite slow and, and, and moreover, very sensitive to that um, effective uh, number of uh, uh, non-zero uh, value. So, so I think um, from that aspect, I think, I think there's still some, some, some work that needs to be done, but I, but I haven't specifically looked at uh, applying the um, that prior to to to, to the GG mix model. Can you compare with the Bolt LMM as well, or Bolt LMM is uh, another quite popular, uh, you know, software from uh, uh, Paul Peru uh, from Harvard. Yeah, but uh, Bolt LMM, I, from my understanding, is univariate, right? Uh, yeah, that's for testing GWAS. You're right. Yeah, so yeah, you yeah. might be uh, work with the PRS, but you know, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So so. Um, I agree. Again, I think there's 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 debate there between the different methods, but we you know to, to kind of make this the, the paper more targeted, we kind of only focused on these multivariable methods. Um, but but um, and and you know some people would argue like kind of comparing univariate to multivariable is kind of comparing apples to oranges. Um, but I think for for PRS, I think there is value in comparing the the two uh, because you know you, these are options for 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 PRS methods, particularly as you mentioned for summary stats methods. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you for the questions. Thank you. Uh, Suresh, I think you have a question. Yeah, um, thanks Sahir for the talk. Uh, it's a bit of a general question. I just wanted to get your view on this. Um, so in your modeling uh, strategy, especially with these, you know, with these large parameter spaces, um, so you're using a validation-based approach, right? So a model that fits prediction data or training data better is a better model. Uh, in your experience, how well does this actually map on to sort of ground truth based approaches. So if you go this way, do you actually derive something that later turns out to be correct in terms of the interactions between the parameters or which parameters were included, et cetera? So it's like two approaches to modeling, right? One is based on verification. The other one is based on sort of trying to capture the truth. So I thought, I just wanted to get your thoughts on this. Yeah, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a really good point for, for discussion. Uh, thank you for the question. I, I think so far in my experience, so, so particularly in that application of, of bone mineral density. Uh, if, if, if you talk to, to, to someone like Brent, 
um, he basically tells you like, I, I don't care what goes into the, to the model, just get me the best prediction. So, so from that point of view, I think, it, again, I think that speaks to the, the, the so-called two cultures of, of Leo Bryman is that, you know, you want to try to get, um, I think it, it's really context dependent in terms of actual um, performance and, and whether or not it, it has picked up uh, the, the, the truth from in our experiments, uh, particularly in the real data where we did know that, you know, in some cases, you know, there's, there's like a causal snip. Um, we, we didn't see, uh, we actually used a, an information criterion um, for, for, for some of them because there were such small data sets and then doing this uh, training model selection validation would be infeasible because they were so small. Uh, so we had to use some sort of information criterion and in our experience, like those seem to work well. Uh, I do know that there's some literature on, on cross-validation and how that can be an issue, uh, especially if a lot, of the, um, a lot of the variables are measured with, with error. And so, so that can definitely be uh, a problem. Yeah, just as a very quick short follow-up. Uh, so I've noticed while reading modeling papers that there could be, it's just my reading experience, of course, there's a bit of a tendency to overvalue the actual model that is derived instead of its prediction utility. So the particular structure of the model then take, gets taken to be reflecting something about the truth without exploring the full model space. As in alternative models would do equally well, right? But you don't span the whole space. Right. Is this something that's a valid concern? Definitely, definitely. I think, I think that's why, I mean, that's why I think um, originally like 10 years back when I started hearing about GWAS and, and hearing like the computer scientists and statisticians like kind of almost um, dismiss GWAS. Um, I think now you look back, I think GWAS is a super powerful technique because it's got that kind of validation component, right? So it's, it's not just so much you find a SNP, you got to go validate it. Whereas a statisticians, we're not doing any of that work, right? We're just kind of um, coming up with the model, but definitely not testing the, the, the span of all the different possible models, um, which, which is costly. Um, but at the same time, I think we, I think we, we have it easy in the sense that we're able to hide behind these models and say, look, we're getting a good prediction, um, but we're, we're, we're not doing any sort of that validation work. So I think it's, it's definitely a, a concern and, and, and definitely a plus for the, for the GWAS uh, literature and GWAS um, technique. I think it's, it's, it's super powerful. Great. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other questions remaining? Hey, um, I got one. Sure, go ahead. Uh, it's a bit of a uh, interpretation question in terms of the results you get from, uh, let's say, Lasso. I know that the, the direction is supposed to be unique, but then the uh, actual weights are not necessarily unique. Uh, in that setting, are you able to, is there a certain amount of interpretability you're losing by using these approaches, or uh, is it fine? Uh, I know you, uh, uh, PRS is more focused on the prediction anyway, but. Uh, yeah, I'm just curious about your thoughts. Like in terms of the actual like estimated coefficients you're saying? Yeah, like if you were to look at the uh, in normal models, you have a p-value and things that you can say, okay, this is important by this much. But uh, for lasso, for example, can we interpret those weights or coefficients the same way? Yeah, I think that that's the danger with and, and that's the danger with these models that we we tend to interpret a non-zero beta as being the you know being associated. Um, and, and that's the, I, I would say the motivation for, for these Bayesian approaches, which give you proper credible intervals around each beta. And, and um, you know, you, there's a classic saying in stats, right? You, you can be a point estimate, you're, you know, could be 100% accurate, but 0% um, confident. Um, so, so you can be, you know, it, it's very, it's a very fine line to walk in terms of um, assuming that, that the effect that you're getting actually mm -hmm. means uh, something, you know, I, I think that's where the kind of the validation part comes in and even the direction, right? If a lot of these effects, these genetic effects are so small that the direction can go in either, in either case, right? If you, if you just change the, 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 the training set. And so I think that's where you need to be a little bit more careful and, and really look at, um, uh, the, 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 the biology of it and, and see if this is actually something that's worth exploring or worth looking into. Well, thanks. Great. Um, so, Sahir, I think I will uh, just thank you very much for, for again, a fantastic talk. 
Uh, I learned a lot, uh, and I think many people uh, also learned a lot from your talk. So that was fantastic, and thanks for taking the time. Thanks, everybody, for attending. Uh, so we'll wrap it up for today, and uh, we'll see you uh, next week. So thanks a lot. Just actually quickly, met you. Uh, next week yep. is spring break, so we'll be taking... Oh, that's uh, right. Yeah, we'll be taking... Well, sorry, reading week. Yep. So we will be taking a break, and then we'll be returning on uh, March 9 yep. with... Um, Albert Goldbetter, who is sponsored by Kanbam, uh, and the, the email will be sent out uh, this week to with the information. Yeah, thank you, Alex. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thanks for the Thanks, questions. Sahir. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Sahir. That was fun to have you. <laughs> and, yeah, uh, so, so where, where had you given this, this the, the French version of the talk? Uh, and uh, you can. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, it was, uh, ah, so you were... I had 